It's time to accelerate. Hey friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 590 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. Joining me on the show today is my guest, Sam Malakarjanan. Sam is an executive strategist at HubSpot and author of the book, Inbound Commerce, How to Sell Better Than Amazon. We're going to touch a number of interesting topics in this episode, uh, starting with why domain experience has a higher correlation to achieving quota based on studies that, that Sam's going to talk about. Domain experience has a higher correlation to achieving quota than closing ability, that mythical closing ability. Really important lessons for sellers to understand. And we're going to talk about why competing for customers and grabbing their attention earlier in their buying process leads to a higher close rate. Intuitively makes sense, but it's something that doesn't happen that often. We're also going to talk about the future of sales in particular, how AI, artificial intelligence, will disrupt the buyer's journey and what that will mean for you, the seller. It's all good stuff. You want to stick around. Make sure you learn this today. If you'd like to see the summary notes for this episode, go to andypaul.com forward slash 590. I've been talking the last couple of weeks about a new announcement for me, a new venture I'm launching with my friend, Jocko Vanderkoy, who's the founder of Winning by Design, author of a great book too called SaaS Blueprints for a SaaS Sales Organization. And we're launching the Sales Leadership Accelerator Mastermind. It's a unique, intensive, 12-month learning, coaching, and mastermind program for the sales leaders of businesses that depend on recurring revenue. So if that's you, this could be the program for you. Our first session kicks off in December. There's still just a few seats still open available to participate in the program. So go to our website for more information. That is, I'll spell it out for you. It's S-A-A-S-S-L-A-M dot com. S-A-A-S-S-L-A-M dot com to learn more and enroll today. Finally, before we get to our conversation with Sam, I want to remind you that we want to hear your questions about sales, sales management. Submit some good questions at andy at andypaul.com. You can email them to me or go to my website, andypaul.com. A red button, lower right-hand corner. Click on that. Leave an audio message for us. And uh, we'll answer those questions on the air in my Friday conversations with my friend, Bridget Gleason. All right. So, excited now to talk with Sam. Sam, welcome to Accelerate. Thanks for having me. Hey, how did I do on your name? That was perfect. Oh, actually. excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So, first question I ask all my guests is, in your mind, what's the single biggest challenge facing sales reps today? The single biggest challenge is, is not actually AI and some of those other topics we want to talk about. The single biggest challenge is that the information power paradigm has shifted, right? It used to be that when I wanted to buy something, um, I would go to you and if I wanted pricing sheets, you would have to give them to me. If I wanted feature specs, you would have to give them to me. Uh, you owned that entire process. If I wanted testimonials, like you were going to introduce me to your college roommate or something who's going to mm -hmm. tell me you were awesome. That's not the case anymore. I arrive in a sales process with more information than I can possibly process. I actually, I almost feel bad when I buy a car now um, because that poor sales rep is really just the transaction point for me. There's a little bit of haggling left on price, but I already know every car on their lot. I already know what everybody else within a hundred miles has paid for that car from every other lot. And I actually know what his company paid for that vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of the power that we used to rely on, on, Oh yeah, but it has this widget and like, ah, oh, but wait, there's more and like price haggling and stuff. All of that's gone. And the role of sales has changed from being a pure closer um, and the, the sort of the traditional arts of persuasion to being uh, an educator and a coach who has to – my the core value of a human sales rep, uh, and the reason we haven't all been replaced by e-commerce yet, is that we have the ability to help you make sense of all that information, right? You have more information than you could possibly use. We have the ability to help you make sense of that. That's, that's the biggest challenge we're facing right now is shifting our sales culture, sales training, and sales methodology to be oriented around coaching and teaching rather than closing. Yeah, it's sort of interesting because there are – Books have been written that that actually take sort of the opposite point of view, saying that to some degree, saying that one of the great things about all the technology we have is that actually it it rather than being overwhelmed by information, that actually consumers and buyers these days are actually pretty adept 
as you are when you gave your car example, of navigating through all that information. So if that's, yeah. that's really the case, then then where is that real value point with the sales rep, with the, with the buyer? So we have, we have too much information. We're okay at figuring out what information matters to us. Um, but the thing is, is I don't buy cars, nor do I think about cars um, all day, every day. Uh, and the person who works there knows what features matter. They know uh, what other people have used them for. They, they know that level of empathy that goes uh, an abstraction beyond um, just what the features are. Um, we, um, we did a study um, a, a little while back that was just running a correlation coefficient analysis on sales reps and who had the highest correlation to quota attainment. So who was best likely to hit quota long term? Uh, and we we had managers rate their sales reps on things like uh, closing ability and developing rapport, overcoming objections, the classic sort of sales characteristics. Um, but we also threw in some other things in there to see what the long term correlation would be. And what we consider the traditional sales characteristics, closing ability, et cetera, actually had a negative correlation to quota attainment. You were mm -hmm. less likely to hit quota if you were good at that closing long term. If you were good at closing, then if you were just mediocre at everything. The thing that had the highest co correlation to quota attainment was previous domain experience. Um, so in at, at HubSpot, for example, people who have been marketers before are the best sales reps. And the reason that is is because you have that empathy and you have that insight to understand, to really understand like what their problems are, what they're trying to do with them, um, and and walk them through that process. So yeah, we have a lot of information, but there's a big difference between like information and understanding, um, and that's the bridge that sales reps can, that good sales reps are are hitting quota by helping their prospects uh, cross. So that's interesting. So does that mean you should always hire people with domain expertise? I mean, if you can, right? Uh, that's that's what what I love as as the ideal thing because it's easier for me to teach you a lot of sort of the core sales tactics and teach you listening and stuff than it is for me to teach you empathy um, or sure. that sort of background in it. So, yeah, I mean, if you're selling, uh, well, there there be people know. that disagree with that somewhat, but I mean, yeah, yeah but I I guess the question I find is that gets thrown back because I I largely agree with that that statement mm -hmm. you made is that the experts aren't as curious i don't i'm not saying i agree with this i'm saying this is a statement i hear right the problem is when hiring specialists versus generalists is the trouble is the specialists think they know everything so they stop learning and they're not as curious i, I don't know i i'd say that that's a different characteristic than previous domain experience um, my thing is like when I'm talking to somebody, so my, my first half of my career was in sales. My second half of career has been in marketing and product development. Um, when I'm talking to somebody who's, and I'm, we're selling a sales software and they're doing something interesting in sales, I'm way more curious, right? I'm like, that's so cool. I never thought to do it that way. Um, or I never thought of the solution or the problem from that perspective. I'm way more curious because I have that background. Um, now in terms of professional development, you're probably right in that specialists um, in any given discipline may be tempted to think they already know everything. Um, and that's a human characteristic that we all have to get past. Right? We, we live in a world, uh, Deloitte has a great study on this, on um, the decay of what they call knowledge stocks. Knowledge stocks being the value of whatever you know right now. Um, and Deloitte's research shows that it's gone from being uh, whatever you know right now used to carry you through like 20 or 30 or 40 years of your career, uh, that decay has come to down to about five years. So whatever okay. you know right now is going to carry you through maybe the next five years. So we, we have a fundamental transportation transformation that everybody's going to have to adapt to. Yeah, I'm surprised the cycle's that long. I mean, I would have said three. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so Deloitte study is a year and a half old at this point. See, and, it's uh, <laughs> decay, it's decayed knowledge already. <laughs> it's already, it's, that's so frustrating. I, I published a book, I, when did I publish? I published my book in 2013, already out of date. Already out of date. Like I, 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 I need to publish a second edition now. Or you can read the first like half chapters, the first like five chapters, but don't read anything after that. What was the book? Uh, we published a book called How to Sell Better Than Amazon that introduced the concept of uh, of competing in the education phase. So mm -hmm. don't don't fight over people who are ready to buy and know what they want because it's a bloodbath. Uh, fight over people who uh, don't know what they want to buy and just know what the problem is, um, and then get really good at nurturing lifetime value. 
right? So the reason Starbucks wins is because the average Starbucks customer lifetime value is over $14,000. Um, so they're not trying to sell a six dollar cup oh, which, of coffee. Which sandwich. is just insane, by the way. But anyway, go ahead. Well, yeah, no, but exactly. Like they're not trying to sell a six dollar cup of coffee and sandwich. They're trying to acquire and retain a fourteen thousand dollar plus customer. Um, and so that was the premise of the book was uh, was compete f- for customer retention and compete for customers earlier in the buying process. So what's out? What's out of date? So that's the first half of the book. That's not out of date yet. In fact, I'm still beating that uh, that. Uh, concept into people. What's out of date though was everything that followed after um, when we talked about specific Facebook tactics or uh, sure. tools that existed or how to design a product detail page. Um, really a lot right. of the stuff that uh, <laughs> that was that seemed really important back then. Um, Facebook deprecated some of those features six months after we published uh, and some of the companies we reference have, uh, have already been acquired or gone out of business. So the first half of the book I still think is very useful. Second half, eh, you can probably skip that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why writing books about interpersonal relationships and things like that, uh, a little more greenfield than yeah. social media, <laughs> which, as yeah, you said, sure. changes, changes <laughs> in a heartbeat. Yeah. All right, so talk a little bit then about, we sort of started going this path about reinvention and the future of selling, and you raised the term of AI before, is is so you're you know, researching in this field is, is let's start talking about what do you see as sort of the impacts or three to five years for on sales reps of AI, machine learning, predictive analytics, the things that are coming that can handle certain tasks that people do, not necessarily all of them, but certain. And what does that mean for people? Yeah. So uh, because this is a podcast, you can't see that every time I say AI, I do air quotes with my fingers. Yeah. Um, we are quite a long ways away from what we would call like, you know, general artificial intelligence. Um, and some people are, I, I'm torn between thinking people are hyperventilating unnecessarily. Um, and I'm not worried about like the rise of the machines and thinking about that most people are not at all prepared for the professional disruption that really good cognitive computing and machine learning and natural language processing is going to bring, um, into the forefront. Um, and this is, so there, there was a study recently or last year that really caught my attention specifically on this. A company called Conversica um, did a study where they compared traditional sales reps to um, bot-based prospecting, um, bot-based prospecting bots, and they filled out the and, contact sales and, form. Well, let's, for, just, let's just make sure that people understand that Conversica does have a stake in the game. Just to, oh, horrendously biased. <laughs> yeah, this is okay. what they sell. Yeah, I know. Just, uh, so, so, so people are listening know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so this is what they sell. But what they found, I think, will uh, resonate with most of us who have ever managed a sales team, um, which is that so they filled out more than 500 contact sales forms pretending to be what they thought was the idealized lead um, for that prospect. And uh, less than a third of those, less than half the, the companies followed up at all. Um, mm-hmm. And less than a third of those companies followed up quickly or repeatedly um, with what is the most qualified lead. And part of this is because human beings are difficult to scale, right? So I have to be very judicious of deciding which leads I'm going to follow up with how often and in what way. Um, but part of it is like, yeah, like we suck at following up with leads sometimes, uh, particularly when we know it's going to be a long consultative sales process. Um, whereas bots have nothing better to do than, than follow up with leads. Mm-hmm. And I still think they might be able to do the prospecting a bit better, but I don't actually think they're going to be better closers. Um, And the reason is what I said earlier, which is that bots are incapable of having previous life experience because they're not alive yet, thankfully, knock on wood. Um, They they cannot possess empathy. They can't look out through the prospect's eyes and see the problem the way the prospect sees it and then use that in their their sales process. Um, As long as they don't crack that empathy piece, uh, that past life experience piece, um, we're not only going to be safe – but we're actually going to live happier lives as sales reps because we don't want to do prospecting. Like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> dude, it sucks. Come on. I've done it. And, and by the way, I've done some of the most annoying prospecting you've ever heard of. Like, have you ever walked through the mall and been like harassed by people trying to sell you cell phones? Yeah. yeah I used to train those people. Uh, and it, you know, it, it was, it was literally, you, you got to agree to eat and everything else like that. Right. Smile and dial, depending mm. on what your, what your model is. 
you know, if I pitch 200 people in a day, 195 of them are going to question my parentage and insult me. Um, but five of them are going to buy and that's my quota and that's, that's good to go. We all hate that. We hate selling that way. We hate prospecting that way. And that way is fortunately dying a, a relatively painful, uh, if stubborn death. Um, the things that we're going to be good at because bots can do that all day. Like, Hey, do you want to buy now? Do you want to buy now? Do you want to buy? Um, what they cannot do is that effective closing sequence uh, that's going to help somebody buy something. Um, by the way, I, fun fact, I can do that pitch in Spanish, even though I don't speak Spanish. Um, <laughs> just because I was selling in malls in Florida, and so pitching to people in Spanish was was important. And because that process was, you know, this is, I'm thinking back in like 2004 when I was working in T-Mobile, that process was what we would call now very botified, right? Because I didn't care what the prospect said to me in answer to my question, I was going to ask them the next question in my sequence and they would either walk away or finish going through my sequence and give me some money. Right. So I could do senior, senior, banca, banca, un minuto, con quien su teléfono celular, right? Like I run through that. Um, again, I don't actually speak Spanish, but that was because I was approaching the sale the way a current bot might approach the sale, um, which barely worked back then is hanging on by its fingernails to life right now and it's not going to survive much longer you have you have to focus on the on the empathy based selling well no what you're saying though is it's 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 going to move to be bodified yeah all, all that initial prospecting piece like the 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 the, the beautiful thing about so, AI, so, so it, S- sdrs basically gonna have, to, <laughs> yeah. gonna have to find a way to in your opinion gonna have to find a way to add value in a way beyond what they're doing today Beyond the SDRs, yeah. And that's actually one of the concerns I have for the sales profession, though, is most of us learned our skills there, right? Because we weren't very smart, you know, we were fresh out of college or high school or whatever. Um, and we and we learned our chops in the sales profession uh, and a lot of the, the skills that carry us through later career um, in our SDR phase or our outbound prospecting phase. Um, and what happens when you remove the entry level? Right. Like once we botify that, how are we going to develop good sales reps 20, 30 years from now um, when there are no more SDRs? That's actually my bigger concern um, in terms of bots replacing some functions of sales reps is what's that going to do to our training and hiring pipeline? So what's the answer? Uh, if I knew that, I would have already launched a, a consulting <laughs> company telling you exactly what to do to rebuild your sales and hiring pipeline. I, you know, we're going to have to find some other way either to develop sales reps um, or or train sales reps um, on those interpersonal skills uh, that that we learn uh, th- that we learned at that phase. It might be intra-company selling. It might be um, actually. <laughs> I'm literally just thinking about this now. What somebody should build is a prospect bot. Um, where you can, because there's all these like Watson and stuff has so IBM so Watson can practice has, on it. Yeah. IBM Watson has all these, uh, has these personality characteristics that you can bake into the, um, the cognitive, the cognitive algorithm. Right. Um, you should be able to feed the psychographic data from your target buyer persona into like a, an IBM Watson or something like that. And then they should use natural language processing for me to just try selling to it and practice that way. Um, yeah, somebody listening should go launch that startup and I'll be a customer. <laughs> well, I think that's, I hadn't thought about that, but I think that's a, that's a really interesting point is, is yeah, if you do remove sort of the entry level stage of sales careers, how do people, how do people get into it? I don't know. I worry about it for all of them. I worry about it for our, our tech support folks too, right? Like, uh, we generate customer care people. Customer, yeah, customer care, customer success folks, we generate a ton of really stupid inbound questions, right? Customers that are like, where's this button? Mm-hmm. And like the, the button is in front of you, or at least the answer is in the documentation, right? Where Watson can, or whatever the cognitive algorithm is, can just look at your tech documentation and develop the answer. Uh, and that's where our junior customer success folks generally start their career. And then they move up and in the software world, at least they either go onto the product team um, or they go onto the consulting and, and the heavy meaty customer success team where customers are asking questions that aren't in the documentation. Um, and I think about that for them too. Like not, not that we're doing this anytime soon, but if, if companies start replacing uh, the entry level of customer success folks, which it's very easy to do, the technology already exists to do that. Um, if you start replacing those folks with bots, uh, how are we going to have the good customer focused product developers and customer focused, uh, consultants and, uh, of the future? I don't, I don't know. All right. That'll be a separate conversation. <laughs> we'll have. 
I mean, that, it's it's a fantastic question. Yeah. I think for people listening, it's it's well worth their consideration is to think about in their own careers is the first point we talked about is, you know, how do you stay relevant? Basically, is what we we're talking about as 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 this environment develops that has more artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language process, so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right. I mean, humans, empathy is sort of the, the sole domain, unique domain of, of humans at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, for for the organizations looking to build that, interesting question. All right. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Could, somebody, see, if you launch that startup, I'll 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 be one of your beta testers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Same thing. I'll we'll all, uh, we'll all be investors in it. Yeah. Um, so let's again let's say our sort of three to five year time frame, if not a little bit longer. Is so. What does the salesperson look like then? I mean, what do they really need to be focusing on, in your opinion, in terms of skills that besides empathy, and which I think you know people can mm-hmm. learn how to develop that, but you know, what else do they really need to be focused on to add value to customers in that environment? I, you know, I would focus on patience too. The, the thing that AI is going to free us up from doing is figuring out what are the best conversations to have in what context at what time. Um, you know, the Facebook folks and the work that they've done at Fair um, is just terrifyingly good. They're actually better at predicting how you're going to respond to something than your family and friends are, uh, based off of just a very small data set of likes. Well, why don't you, um, why don't you tell people what this FAIR is? I'm sorry, FAIR is the Facebook Artificial Intelligence Research. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and they're, again, they're better than, uh, than friends and family and spouses at predicting how you're going to respond to stimuli. So as we begin to integrate that into the CRM space and the marketing technology space, um, what we're going to end up with is a really good idea of who's ready to make a switch, who's not happy, who's got some challenges, who's running into frustrations. Uh, and we've got to be patient and good at having those conversations. Um, I think I said earlier in the interview, our temptation is, because this is how we were trained, and this is how I trained people, was ABC, always be closing, right? Put that coffee down, coffee is for closers. Um, this is how we trained people, and it's going to be a lot more about pipeline development and nurturing and getting really good at having those, those conversations within context, um, than it, than it is now about just, you know, hitting the monthly quota or, or weekly quota or whatever you're on. But it seems like one of the potential dangers is that, and dangers may be overstating, um, complications maybe is that, you know, you're already seeing applications coming out and I'll you know, use your air quotes around AI, <laughs> but, but like doing real time transcription of, phone calls. So it's like we on a phone call and the AI is in the background, the bots transcribing the call and then throwing up on the screen, ask this, ask mm-hmm. that, and so on. Um, yeah, and in those environments, do, do people stop learning? That's one of my concerns is, you know, if you're always being nudged to do something, and mm-hmm. it's hugely distracting, so I think it interferes with your ability to develop a relationship and be focused, but Secondarily, is is if we're always being told what to do, do we ever really learn how to handle situations that aren't just straight by the book? I mean, that's that actually goes back to my earlier concern, right? Which is that learning is what allows us to grow and develop in our careers. Um, it's also I uh, I I am less uh, impressed by the current state of AI research, I think, than uh, than some of my contemporaries. Um, and and I, you just you can't get that good at predicting uh, how humans are going to react. You know, I think about, I think back to, I was once on a sales call with somebody and, um, and I started and I didn't shout into the phone, but I'm like, that is the stupidest (laughs) expletive question that I have ever heard. Um, Like Bill, like, you know, what do you think you should be embarrassed that you just asked me that question. And my manager looks, looks at me and she's like, you can't talk to prospects that way. And I'm like, trust me. And I closed the deal. He's been a customer ever since. He's he's actually now a, a resale a resale partner, and he had, you know, the, the, there are all these exceptions that we have in intuition and the the interpersonal relationships that we have that I just don't know if you can codify quite yet, right? Um, and this this is actually the thing about sales. What I what I like being called physics envy, right? So sales, marketing, and all business professionals, all economists in general, have physics envy, where we like to think that. Um, if we just understood enough about the system that we can give those exact prescriptive, like do this, do this, do this, do this, it's an algorithm. Um, and maybe that's true on some future quantum level. Uh, but I like when I'm teaching at Harvard, I like to use the example of, you know, I can drop a pen a hundred times and a hundred times out of a hundred, it will hit the ground. 
I can stand in Harvard Square handing out $101 bills and at least 20 people will call me a chowder head and like tell me to go home. Right. It's, it's not always this, like this, uh, this algorithmic, uh, you know, logical progression sequence that, that you want to, that, that machine learning specifically with their pattern recognition is, is designed to do. Um, so I don't know, like, yeah, well, I'm, yeah, I'm, think, I'm well, not saying we're, we're never going to get to that point, but we're, we're definitely not there yet. Like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that yet. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that that uh, helps preserve that is the fact that the algorithms that you're talking about are all designed by humans. Yeah, the algorithms, and, and also you know, like the the good machine learning. The, the wrong way to code AI is to tell is to have like an infinite series of if then statements, right? The right way to do it is to to train it to learn the way that you want to learn. Um, and if you do that, like yeah, you can potentially in the future have that really good level of of sales rep guidance. Maybe, I, dude, honestly, okay. I am I am done yeah, saying ahead. that anything is impossible. Which is um, a, which is a good position to have. We 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 have we have somebody in Houston working on an actual freaking warp drive, right? Like we have uh have done in, incredible things. Uh and just the idea to me that I, I don't possess enough confidence or hubris or whatever you want to call it to say something's impossible. Um, but it's very improbable right now. Uh and it's definitely there's there's a there's a concept in in corporate strategy called the extendable core that Clay Christensen and Max Wessel mm-hmm. introduced um, in terms of how do you survive disruption. Great articles on surviving disruption, and surviving disruption is a is a temporary is a temporary state of affairs, right? There, the extendable core for them is what's the thing that your that a disruptive disruptor couldn't replicate without adopting the same cost structure. Uh, so the reason there are still Hilton properties is because um, they have like a concierge, a standardized service, they've always got a business lounge, they've got a points program, et cetera. Airbnb can't replicate that without adopting the same cost structure. Um, we have the same thing, right? We, at least they can't do that for now, right? We have the same thing when it comes to AI. We have an extendable core, which is our ability to have good interpersonal relationships, understand questions, and experience empathy. Um, and until quote unquote AI is able to replicate that without, or, you know, without adopting the same cost structure in terms of processes per second as we are. Um, and just the, the cognitive capacity of the human brain, uh, that's our extendable core. That's what we have to focus on, right? Everything else they are going to do better than us. Uh, but that does not mean that that is going to carry us through forever, right? The we're 2024, I think is the earliest estimate of, um, Kurzweil's uh, modification on Moore's law. So mm-hmm. the the short answer of that being, when will computers have the same processing per second per thousand dollars as human beings? Twenty twenty four is the earliest estimate of that. So yeah, uh, my 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 tip is is focus on on being really good at the EQ uh, element of se- of of selling because that's going to be the last thing to go. But I'm not saying that that's going to be a forever disruption proof. <laughs> no, I think I it's know? yeah, I think it's a sucker's bet to say. Something will never happen, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, whether it's 2024, I, I just read recently, it's 2040. Somebody put the date uh, with Kurzweil's disruption. But yeah, yeah. It, it's possible it could come. I mean, it wasn't just but four years ago that you know some really prominent scientists at MIT and other places were saying that autonomous vehicles were will never work. I remember the first DARPA challenge, man. That was uh, uh, the first DARPA challenge for getting a vehicle to just drive itself across an empty desert. It was mm-hmm. 2006, right? Yeah, no, I remember. <laughs> it wasn't long ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, in the space of four years, you know, the people that were leading minds and AI and other things were basically proven wrong. So, it's not that they've rolled out. You know, obviously, it's going to take longer than we anticipate for it to, to happen, probably based on what's going on today, but it is going to happen. I mean, the functionality, yeah. the functionality is being built into Teslas today. Yeah, I mean, the, the good thing about self-driving cars um, and, and the thing that protects them, they have two things going for them. One of which is um, we insist that they coexist with human beings and human beings are terrible drivers. Um, the other one being that network latency is just too slow, right? So if you are if you have like a, a 100 millisecond network latency over your cellular reception or whatever, um, you've just gone like 20 feet and killed a child if you're waiting for that central computer to uh, decide what to do. Um, and the edge computing required for you to do all those calculations on board is what they're working on. Right. So we can't just centrally control all of these things, otherwise it would be easy. Um, but 
all of those are surmountable technical challenges. Right? <laughs> yeah. None of that is impossible to handle. And, and as an avid bicyclist, I can't wait for self-driving cars to <laughs> replace some of these people <laughs> on the roads. I'll, oh my God, we're ho- terrible. So, hopefully I'll still I, I be talk- alive to, to celebrate when it happens. You know, my, my perspective on this really changed because I'm like, we should, we should stop this because, you know, we're going to disrupt uh, the economy and whatever. Like I was sort of taking the Elon Musk, the team Musk version of this. Right. Um, but the, then I saw a PBS documentary where they're like, you know, if we cured uh, automobile casualties, it would be like curing polio twice in terms of the number of lives that it saves every oh, year. Sure. So I'm like, I'm like, yeah, okay, now I'm on Team Zuckerberg. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think, yeah, Musk's, you know, the sky is falling. Well, it's not just Musk, Stephen Hawking as well. So both think AI is an existential threat to, yeah. to people like you and me, people like all of us, as a matter of fact. So, um, <laughs> So, for people listening to the sales podcast, as we've talked about self-driving cars. So sorry, on. sorry. No, it's okay. You didn't do it. I, this is the way we roll here. So, um, I'm just trying to think, do we have any other questions? We're almost near the end. Any other questions asked that... Um, well, I guess the last one then is, is, so, how do you think then the buyer's journey will change as a result of AI and natural language processing and so on? So, the, the beautiful thing there is I get to self-select the experience that I want. Um, and it gets really good at helping me predict what I want. And it will unfortunately, by definition, get good at influencing what I want. Um, that's where we get into sort of the gray legal area. Um, but there's a, there's a more interesting study for me than the quota attainment one that we do every year um, that asks a simple question, who do you trust? Uh, we list out a bunch of professions like teachers and doctors and stuff. And as you'd expect, they're at the top. The majority of people trust teachers and doctors. Uh, further down, you've got like baristas and professional sports athletes. And then further down, you've got politicians and lobbyists. And then at the very bottom, rounded up to 1% is sales reps, rounded down to 0% is marketers, um, are people who say that they trust sales and marketing professionals. Um, we rank lower than bots. We rank lower than bots in terms of like whether or not people actually trust us. Uh, and I want to point out that the last time we ran the survey was in 2016. If and you who, paid attention, who did, who did that survey? A HubSpot? It's it's a HubSpot survey. Yeah. Um, well, it's a HubSpot in cooperation with with uh, some other folks. But uh, we did it in 2016. And if you paid any attention to American politics in 2016, we lost to those people, man. Like sales reps are less trustworthy than politicians and lobbyists. And I think that's the First of all, humiliating and not like close, like they're significantly outside of the margin of error above us. Um, We have to fix that problem by changing the nature of sales and the nature of marketing, using AI to do all this stuff um, before we solve any other problems. We are sales and marketing are two professions that had an entire industry that sprung up around preventing us from doing our jobs. Right. So like ad blockers, tons of people use ad blockers, tons of people use caller ID, tons of people fast forward through commercials, literally an entire industry sprung up to prevent us from doing our jobs because we're so freaking annoying. And if we don't solve that problem, um, the people who are investing in stopping us from doing our jobs are going to exceed our ability to irritate prospects into submission. So I, I think that's a far more core, uh, core concern. Um, for the for the future of AI, for the future of all of this technology, and how and how it's fitting into it, um, is we've got to change like how and why we do that. I'm not saying I have the right answer on what that is, but if we don't solve that problem of if we couldn't beat politicians and lobbyists in 2016, we're never going to beat them with the way things are now. Um, <laughs> then then none of the, all the rest of this is just a, is just academic. None none of the rest of it matters. If we don't fix that. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah, there's a, uh, I saw an article in Harvard Business Review that uh, cited research by Gartner, I guess it was, that said that, interestingly, that buyers surveyed uh, business, business to business and relatively complex as enterprise buyers mm-hmm. actually trust salespeople more than the companies they work for. And I, thought that was, <laughs> and I thought that was very interesting. So I will say, and uh, this is a bias of my experience, because uh, I've worked for B2C, I've worked for B2B, I've worked for B2C to B, all kinds of stuff. Um, those companies have good, smart sales reps. It was the weirdest experience in my life when I first came to HubSpot, and I would sit down on a sales call, and the prospect was like excited. They're like, hey, everybody, like HubSpot's on the phone. Like, yeah, let's all get around in the conference room. Like, let's see what HubSpot has to say. Let's talk about this. Uh, and I think the B2B companies have nailed uh, 
what the future of selling or they're approaching what the future of selling needs to be uh, from the perspective that everybody else needs to adopt. Um, part of that is because their customers are worth a lot more, right? So they can invest in good training, good people who are well motivated mm-hmm. and who aren't just like, they don't have to do 80, 80 calls a day, smile and dial. Like they don't hate their lives. Their souls aren't crushed. Um, drive by Daniel Pink, right? Like uh, what motivates sales reps um, in terms of uh, the amount of st- base salary and stuff they have. B2B can do all of that in a way that the rest of us um, can't always. Um, and so that, that wouldn't necessarily surprise me that they trust uh, sales reps more. And especially since those companies are selling to large companies. Hey, yeah, yeah. Who trusts the other people inside of a large company? Because you have to work with all those people every day and you know that they don't care about you. <laughs> As opposed to the sales rep where you just suspect that they don't care about you. All right, Sam. That's a great way to end it. So <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell people how they can connect with you. I, I know you're you're mobile these days, but uh, how they can sure. connect with you and, and find out more about what you're doing. Sure. So um, if you can spell my last name, uh, it is my Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and website. Um, but and my we'll, wife and we'll I... Spe- we'll spell it out here. It's M-A-L-L-I-K-A-R-J-U-N-A-N. <laughs> yep, that's right. Uh, but there, there's an easier way. Uh, my wife and I are actually on the road uh, for at least the rest of the year uh, shooting a documentary where we're um, talking to entrepreneurs and, and small business owners um, outside of the major markets. Um, and you can go to Sam from the and it'll bring you over to our Facebook page, um, where you can connect with us there. That's, uh, mostly what I'm checking these days, or you can send me a tweet. I check that every day too. All right, Sam. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And friends, thank you for spending this time with us today. Make sure you come back again. Enjoy another fantastic episode of Accelerate. So thanks again for joining me until next time. This is Andy Paul. Good selling everyone. <laughs>